<laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been involved in called Heritage Together. It's uh, seeking to crowdsource data from members of the public. And I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the project aims, aims and backgrounds, and then specifically some themes about uh, doing digital public archaeology that I think have come out of this project. I should add the caveat that I think these are my thoughts. Um, they are probably, possibly, not the thoughts of the whole team. Um, so any mudslinging, uh, please direct it at me rather than uh, my collaborators. Um, so Heritage Together uh, is, a, is, is aiming to produce digital 3D models of standing stones and earlier prehistoric sites in North Wales. Um, it's doing this through a, photo, uh, through a process of photogrammetry, where you produce lots of different pictures of a, a monument and use some smart software to uh, stitch them together and to produce a 3D manipulable model um, output from all of these photographs. Um, we were trying to exploit the prevalence of digital cameras in contemporary society, so most people carry a digital camera with them in daily life. Well, a lot of people carry a digital camera with them in daily life on their smartphone. Um, and also the advances in software and processing power that enabled us to um, produce lots of these 3D models. Um, the project has a number of specific, project-specific um, issues, uh, including the need for a completely bilingual delivery, because our study area is in North Wales, um, and uh, another thing, um, and several other things that I'm not going to dwell on, because I'm more interested in having your thoughts and views on how we can do this better as a process in archaeology. Um, so, North Wales has a lot of standing stones and prehistoric monuments, um, and, but, and possibly because of this embarrassment of riches, a full photographic survey of all of these sites hasn't actually been undertaken. Although these um, places have been uh, the subject of antiquarian and archaeological <coughs> research, at least since the 19th century. Um, so part of the project aims were to document these uh, sites, both as a management tool, a conservation tool, and as a form of active research into rock art in this part of the world. Rock art is actually being discovered in this area increasingly, and it's probably an under-recognised aspect of the archaeological um, resource. So our methodology uh, was using citizen science, uh, crowdsourced um, photos that we were hoping people would gener uh, donate to the project, and there are lots of issues with uh, copyright and uh, Creative Commons licences that, um, that, again, I'm not going to go into in any detail. <coughs> so the project was using digital crowdsourced data as a, as a means to create um, a, an inventory and as a research tool. Um, but we weren't only undertaking digital practice, we um, had a whole host of much more traditional uh, ways of outreach and engagement with members of the public, and this included a whole series of events on site and uh, in museums and um, at our various universities. And we can measure success in terms of visitor numbers in a very um, uh, traditional set of received ways. You know, lots of people came while we were on site and talked to us about what we were doing and what we were hoping to do, and we did non digital rock art inspired murals um, with members of the public, which is lots of fun. And then we can talk about our, um, you know, the digital success, the success of the digital aspects of the project. So we can say that we, um, the project's been live for under a year and we've had 3,000 unique visitors, loads of page views, but we've had a really high bounce rate because we're being targeted by a lot of, I'm not a computer scientist, but bots. It's very exciting. Um, but if, so if we take more, a, a, a more crude interpretation of, um, of our visitor numbers, we can say that we probably had uh, just over one and a half thousand real humanoid people visiting our site, so that's, that's exciting. And what I want to, in the, in the second part of this talk, dwell on this idea of the digital gaze, perhaps. I think we've maybe under-recognised under the importance of having a website um, visibility as a form of outreach in itself and as a form of accountability in archaeology in itself. Uh, so I'll come back to that. And we can go down into more specifics in terms of 
how engaged our visitors were, what, how they um, actually interacted with our website. And we can say that our gallery has had uh, 380 real people looking at the output of our models. And um, on average, they spend just under 10 minutes looking at uh, our, our research output. And I think that is a measure of engagement of some sort. That is, that is a, a, an output <coughs> project. And then we can talk about our actual, maybe what we classify as digital archaeologists. These are people who are actively engaged in our forum and who have produced models <coughs> on our site. So we've got 80, 80 models of 78 sites so far generated. And from a relatively small number of real digital archaeologists who are going out there um, donating 13,000 images for our research project. So we can, we can dig into the scales of engagement that we've achieved both in the real world and um, through this digital archaeological practice undertaking that we've attempted. Okay, so this is where um, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm a prehistorian and I'm talking about specifically digital public archaeology themes that I think might have come out of our project. And the first, and so I, thinking about this, I thought that there might be three themes that I thought were particularly appropriate, or particularly interesting to me, that have come out of this project. So firstly, there's a discussion of crowdsourcing as, a, as an undertaking in research. Sorry. And I think we could draw a difference between data analysis, which is what a lot of crowd sourcing uh, projects seem to be undertaking, and data generation, which I think is, is an important difference. And then uh, a brief foray into the uh, dangerous territory of value, um, and how we understand value and account, uh, how we understand value in terms of public archaeology, and specifically digital public archaeology. And then I want to um, talk briefly about the importance of materiality and immaterial uh, immateriality in the practice of archaeology and then approaches to engagement through digital media. Okay, so <clears throat> um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long history of citizen science and crowdsourcing, particularly in the natural sciences and in ornithological studies in America. These have been going on, national bird studies have been going on in America since 1900 or thereabouts. This is not a new idea, it's the digital delivery that is the innovative part of this. And um, uh, Cornell University tracks citizen science projects in the US and in 2008 they noted 200 explicitly citizen science projects. I think that number's probably increased exponentially. Um, and this is a bit of the talk that's very <coughs> structured, for which I beg your indulgence. But I wanted to make the point that, yes, we are all archaeologists, but, and that doesn't mean, that's not a completely relativistic statement, but, um, you know, there's a great tradition of amateurism in the best sense of the word, and I think we should embrace and encourage that. So, as I said, poorly structured, Dr. Griffiths. Um, okay, back on track. Um, as well as Cornell University um, looking at the nature, uh, the numbers of, of, of crowdsource projects, we can talk about typologies of crowdsourcing. Everybody loves a good typology. Um, I realise this says more about me than, um, than anything else. Uh, my collaborator Ben and I are trying to do the definitive work on hipster beard typology, but that's definitely another presentation. So um, there are. There are uh, this study of the typologies of crowdsourcing projects, which generally went into the natures of the work that was undertaken. So there's this difference between education crowdsourcing projects, conservation crowdsourcing projects, and so on. But I think they, and, and there are lots of different ways, themes that crop up as part of this crowdsourcing approach. Many um, projects, uh, digital projects, include the gamification of research analysis, so people get rewards for uh, analysing data essentially. So the Stardust research projects where uh, contributors look through digital images to find interstellar dust particles. <laughs> I mean, sod the argument of my words, that's amazing. Um, uh, so they get rewards within the, pro within the project. And uh, in the Stardust project, actually, they're, if they're successful in identifying this space dust, they get listed as a contributor in the publication, which I think is a really interesting model 
um, that we maybe should think about um, and its like, applicability in uh, archaeology. Um, and as part of these uh, projects, um, there's a lot of discussion in terms of the motivation of people playing these, doing these uh, analysis projects, this research. So I think that's something that we might need to think about uh, more, more, well I need to think about more thoughtfully. I'm assuming that you're all ahead of me on this, so um, again. And, and, and there's a whole range of different types of projects. And, but this is the difference between people, it's kind of distributed computing or distributed analysis using members of the public, which the majority of these projects tend to be, rather than actually getting people to generate data. I think that's a really important difference. This is uh, Stardust, where you identify interstellar dust. Amazing. Um, Galaxy Zoo, you've probably all heard of. It's exactly the same. You know, you are doing the analysis here. You're not generating the, the data which is to be analysed. Um, the fantastic project feeder. Um, uh, you get lots of interesting hits when you Google that. Um, and then um, <laughs> uh, a slightly... Um, the other thing that I notice is these tend to be science-based projects. They rarely forays into arts and humanities. This is an exception. This is t the Tagger project, which is run out of Bangor and Oxford, I think. And you tag or identify or analyse, effectively again, um, uh, artworks in public collections so that they can be better uh, situated in inventories and databases. So, so that's a, a slightly atypical one. And then um, more heritage archaeological ones, so you've got mass translation projects. Again, I'd argue this is data analysis. And, uh, and uh, other explicitly archaeological projects, such as microparts, um, crowdsourcing projects, uh, where you're helping process um, archaeological 3D imagery. Um, and uh, 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 the possibly the most allied similar project to what we're doing is um, the Atlas of Hillforts project, which you might be aware of. Um, it's uh, run out of Oxford um, and is engendering members of the public, in trying to enable, trying to activate members of the public to actually go out and do <coughs> archaeological surveys, much more traditional archaeological approaches, and then upload the, their results to the website. So again, it's this different emphasis between data analysis, and this is archaeolog you know, more traditional archaeological data collection, and then using the internet as a means, as a vehicle to facilitate um, knowledge exchange. So I think these are subtle but important differences that we need to think about. Okay, so, <laughs> value. Um, yeah. um, this, in terms of very crude differentiations of public archaeology, uh, the project that we were working on is very top down. We had a research project that we were hoping that members of the public would engage with and contribute to. We did lots of other, um, you know, our non standard, our standard kind of archaeological traditional means of engagement as well, but it was fundamentally top down approach. But as a result of this, project, we've been trying to um, respond to members of the public who come to us, who we meet on sites and say, yeah, I, 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 Sam says great, but what I'd really like to do is do a digital model of these um, burials of stones in our graveyard. What I'd really like to do is uh, record uh, a, a Saxon uh, hogback um, uh, burial marker that's in my local church. What I'd really like to do is dig up that rock art site over the corner from the Standing of the Stones. What I'd really like to do is record my local archaeology, which happens to be in the Channel Islands and you're just doing North Wales. So we've responded to all of these um, and more requests and tried to facilitate them. And so we, I and Ben, my collaborator, um, don't see the top-down aspect of this as the end of the project. The project has lots of spin-off things, including excavation and much more traditional archaeological approaches. Really? Oh God, sorry. Right, speed. Um, and we can, we, can, we can use our statistical visitor numbers, both to our sites and to our sites, um, to, to, to address value and engagement and the success of the project that way. But the, the kind of more qualitative aspects, including the you know, volunteer who's come digging with us next year, whose idea it was to dig up the 
roll card site. You know, how do we assess those kind of much more intangible measures of success and value that, that are perhaps situated within a continuum of top down and bottom up and maybe a more subtle <coughs> interpretation? And then finally, uh, my final sort of things that I think about at three o'clock in the morning theme to emerge for me from this project is that perhaps um, inherent tension in this kind of generative digital archaeology project what with um, what some of the other speakers have uh, identified um, attracts many people to archaeology in the first place and this is this positioning between the material and the immaterial and having the digital um, infrastructure that we're generating as a kind of mediator that people somehow feel gets between them and the archaeological site to some degree. So both as professionals who privilege material culture and materiality as a fundamental aspect of our discipline that makes us unique from lots of other uh, people who are interested in the past and for members of the public who come to sites, I think there might be a, a, a tension um, between uh, projects that cease, uh, seek to do crowdsourced digital data and what engages lots of people. Lots of our contributors are photographers, not archaeologists. We might meet them at archaeological sites, but they might, I think they would self-describe more as oh, uh, interest in photography rather than archaeological interest. So there are all kinds of issues associated with that. Um, and, and finally, um, as part of this, I, I, I think I want to return to the concept of the digital gaze. So the idea that um, a very passive relationship with archaeology is, is not sufficient in public archaeology has, has been commented on to some degree. And the critique of a viewing platform approach to public engagement uh, has been made. Uh, but I think in some respects, our digital footprint and our digital visibility and our digital accountability to members of the public by whom we are, most of us, paid to some degree, is an important part of our outreach and one that we might have overlooked. We can assess in digital engagement in lots of different levels, but I don't think we should necessarily do away with the importance of having a digital, having a digital presence as the first point of articulation between us and members of the public. It's all to do with our visibility, and that's an important thing. Um, and these are things that I... Why not so? Yeah, so I, yeah. so I think the um, I think this emphasis on materiality is, is quite important and we should remember it. And finally, a brief code. Um, this is my pri this is my Wikipedia. This is my primary research tool when I do an archaeological site visit or a bit of landscape research. This is my go-to. Because this will tell you how to get to the site what's on the site, the current condition, whether the farmer keeps bulls in the field, uh, and some basic reading matter. And this is congruent for lots of reasons because of various critiques or engagements or discussions of alternative approaches to archaeology that have, have, fact, have influenced, been features of the public archaeology discussion. And I, I, um, I, 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 I think we could learn from this potentially, and I think it has lots of important issues associated with narrative and how we author sites digitally, and the concept of the expert voice, and the concept of multivocality that we should be thinking of in terms of our outreach. Because this, to me, this is on the Modern Antiquarian website, it's for people who, are, who read Julian Cope's book and are interested in slightly alternative approaches to the past. This you probably can't see. This to me is archaeological. You can't read this banner down here. But all of these news items are archaeological stories. These are people doing bottom up what I think is effectively archaeology. Um, and, and the levels of engagement I think are probably quite substantially. Oh, I mean, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> the. Um, I've lost my thread. Uh, they, they're doing good work, and uh, we possibly should learn from this approach to digital public engagement. So this is more archaeology. So to conclude, um, yeah, I will. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
In terms of crowdsourcing research, I think we can usefully differentiate between projects that do analysis and projects that do data collection. We need to think about that in terms of our project design. I suggest that the digital presence, uh, the digital gaze, um, is a non-passive process in some, in some respects, and I think it's important. And also that there is a tension between us and people who are interested in old stuff and old things between materiality and digital pro projects. And I think we need to find better workarounds with delocated cyber communities versus quite a lot of the research which we do, which privileges space and things. And I, I, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention.